Okay. Yeah. Let yes, me connect I I my yeah, up deck to my OBS. That's going to allow me to switch between different scenes. But Okay. So we are here this week. Uh, we're going to continue on some of the stuff that we talked about last week. So if you missed last week's discussion, we talked about um, doing relative compression testing. We did a cylinder leakage test. We on the same vehicle. And this time we're going to go through and we put a pressure transducer and... Uh, in the cylinder. And what a pressure transducer is, instead of using a conventional compression tester, we're going to use this Fluke PV350. And now, we've been doing this for a long time. Um, this is way before Pico came out with their WPS kits. And there's a lot of different manufacturers now. ATS has some. Um, Ditex has some. I've never bought the Pico, the Ditex, or the ATS, or any of the other kits. I've got a couple of these Fluke PV350s around, and that's what I use for the in-cylinder stuff. It's probably not as good as those others that are specifically designed. And from what I understand, and if anybody knows how to tell the difference, I don't, but the newer PV350s, like if you went out and bought one right now that was made in the last year or so, the, they're, they're slower and they don't work as well. So you actually have to find like an older version, like old stock. But unfortunately, they're shaped exactly the same from what I understand. And from the outside, you really can't tell if it's, the, um, if it's a newer model or an older model. And the reason why it's a big deal is because this thing here only costs like $400. Whereas the uh, WPS Pico is like a thousand bucks by the time you buy some of the stuff. And some of the other manufacturers are a little cheaper, but like I said, I just haven't gotten around to buying or trying some of the ones that are um, better, but this is just what we've got. So what we're going to do is going to, in place of a mechanical compression gauge, we're going to use this electronic pressure transducer hooked up to a hose inside the car. Bree, did I introduce you? You just did. Oh, I did. Okay. This is Bree. She's a <laughs> student in this class. Hard working. Always wanting to learn. Kind of digging in deep all the time. So she wanted to be part of this video so bad, so I just couldn't say no. <laughs> now, this is the thing. Um, you might have noticed where I took... I actually have two channels hooked up to this scope. And normally you'd only need one. And the reason why I hooked up a second channel is because is because uh, the, it has a lot of noise if I don't. Um, see here. So right there, right where that plug wire is kind of hooked up to, the, the uh, compression gauge hose assembly, I actually clip a lead to it. And you can see when I run it, I'll take it off, and you'll see that there's quite a bit of noise on there if I don't do that. And I don't know if that's just a quirk with the way these systems, uh, the PV350 works, or if the WPS would do that, if they've got better filtration. But I have to do that on this setup here. So that's kind of unfortunate, but it is what it is. It still works, but it takes up one of my channels. Um, I've, you know, if I've tried hooking it to the battery, and that does make it a little bit better, but it's not perfect. Okay, so what I'm going to do... First of all, let's, I'm going to throw a pattern up here real quick. And, okay. So right in the middle of this screen here, we can see there's a Pico pattern. And Bree admitted, admittingly said she doesn't have any experience with this stuff. So I'm like, perfect. And then you can be the student and you're going to learn. Now, one of the things that this transducer does that's better than a conventional mechanical gauge is it will show you the pressures in the cylinders throughout, or in, in the cylinder, throughout the four-stroke cycle. So we'll, we get to see what the pressure looks like on compression, or then on power, or then on exhaust, then intake, and then back on compression, and you get to watch that occur. So one question I could ask Bree, because she, I'm sure, has gone through an engines class before, right? How long yes. ago was that? Um, like three years ago. Three years ago, okay. <laughs> so it should be fresh in your mind, right? <laughs> Somewhat. So if I were to crank this engine over, what kind of compression do you think I can generate from this? Like a cranking compression, whether I got a mechanical gauge or just a, a normal one. Around uh, 200 sure. PSI. 200 PSI, okay, that's pretty good. I don't know what the spec is for that, but I'm sure it's around 200. 
And traditionally, we would, uh, using a handheld gauge, we would check them. Sometimes we'd check like the first, third, and fifth pump, you know, just to kind of get an idea of what it can pump up to. The first one gives an indication of how well the rings are sealing, that kind of stuff. But um, this transducer is going to show us a basically a linear, not linear, but it's going to show us a, a time base of the pressure change in that cylinder. Now, okay, if we know we're going to get 200 PSI in this engine with it cranking approximately, what do you think it would do when it's running? Would it be higher or lower? I think it would be higher. Higher, okay. Yeah. Well, actually, it won't be. It'll be lower. Why you is know, that? It rules. But uh, let me just go back and say that again. So with the engine uh, cranking over, you've mm -hmm. got full atmospheric air pressure, 15 PSI basically that we have here at sea level. Mm -hmm. That's following that piston in there. And then when it comes around the compression stroke, it can compress that 100%. And you're going to get a, mostly, I'm going to say a full cylinders worth of air. But as that piston comes up, the intake valve is still open. So it's actually not a true full cylinders worth of air. But OK, so that, that's the reason why cranking compression is so high. But with it running, I have an intake manifold vacuum occurring in there. And that means I don't have as much air pressure available. Mm -hmm. So that means when that piston's coming down, I don't have that much air filling into that cylinder behind it. Instead of having 15 PSI, I might only have 5 PSI of air pressure falling in or pushing into that cylinder. So that means I'm going to be compressing less. Think of it like if you're under, under a vacuum, if I'm taking a, an air pocket and stretching it and then compressing it, that's something we can do with air that you can't do with like uh, liquids, right? Yeah. yeah. So an engine that's working under a vacuum is kind of stretching the available air, which means there's not that much, it's, it's, there's not much there to compress. Yeah. So that's a long drawn on explanation <laughs> on why when the engine's running, we don't actually get uh, high anywhere close to 200 PSI or high cranking. You might only see like 70 or 80, mm -hmm. maybe even less. Um, okay. okay. Now if I got in there with it running and I snapped the throttle, what do you, do you think would happen? Because I just opened I, the throttle blades up. I think it would go higher. So it boosts back up, yeah. right? Because kind of the opposite happened. When the engine's running, it's got this vacuum mm -hmm. um, in the intake and it's not letting that much air into the cylinder. But when I crack the throttle open, I'm letting that atmospheric air in there. Mm -hmm. So now I'm back getting closer to my cranking co compression. And mm -hmm. I might not still get to my cranking compression, but usually you get to about 80% of what your cranking compression is. So that's typically what you can do with a mechanical gauge. Now here we're going to go and fire this thing up with the pressure transducer. And you can see the pattern that I have up here. This is actually one that I got, I, I retrieved off of this vehicle um, just before we did the, um, I, I went live. But um, this thing's got a bad misfire. But one of the things I always have the students do first, as I mentioned last week, check a good cylinder and then save that image. So that way when you look at the bad cylinder, you can look at it and you know, well for one, if there's anything wrong with my setup and I, I'm checking a good cylinder, I won't see a good pattern, you know, if my setup is wrong, if my battery's dead, or if I got a lot of interference or noise or something like that. So it's always a good idea to check out a good cylinder so that way I can say, when I move to my bad cylinder, what I'm looking at is truly bad, you know, um, or the, the, if, if there's an issue, if it's truly related to that cylinder. It's not just my setup. It's a way to kind of validate the setup is good. So I'm going to start this up. Everything's wet around here. I see. So that's what the pattern looks like. I know there's a lot of background noise. Let me go ahead and I'll stop it. Okay, so just because there's probably a lot of background noise, I figured why keep it running. So this is the pattern. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a little bit on it. If you look at the way I had it set up here, I, I have a, I'm going to just go full screen on that scope image. I've got um, a special probe set up called PV350. That's what the tool is. And um, it doesn't come preloaded with that. So under tools, custom probes, you actually have to create a new probe. And you go through the process of setting it up. Um, it's not that complicated. You put, uh, like, I, I define a custom base. So like I would do pressure, PSI. Next, you can use this 
this um, linear equation, if you know what numbers to plug in there, y equals mx plus c. Matter of fact, all tell, that's the only thing they give you the ability to do on their scope, but with the Pico, you can get a lookup table, which is kind of nice. So if I change my input units to millivolts, and I said, okay, negative 15 is equal to 50, uh, negative 15 PSI, because this does read negative. And then if I write zero volts is equal to zero PSI, and mm -hmm. 500 millivolts is equal to 500 PSI, that allows me to create this special probe. Now, if a lot of these are already, and, and here it's setting up ranges. I'll just go ahead and click advance because they'll create, if I didn't, they would create those ranges, which you don't really need all those ranges, really. You can just delete those top two and then just deal with those. So that's what I'll do. Uh, if you wanted to add filtering, so it was automatically applying filtering, you could do it that way. And then enter a name. Since I already have a PV350 in there, I'm just going to put PV350B and finish it. And then now, in my library, this, these two kind of homemade um, custom probes are set up there. Well, actually, I'm going to show you a trick here. With Pico and Altel, you can drag these vertical rulers. And what this is going to do is I put this peak to peak right here. And see how these got these lines in between it? I can change that to, by clicking this rulers button here. And this will change how many divisions I have in there. I'm picking four divisions because of the four strokes of the internal combustion engine. Mm. So this right here, this portion right here, is a power stroke. This is exhaust. This is intake. And this is compression. So I just saw my four strokes. You can see I got 720 degrees of revolution there. If I change that to 360, for if I was doing something else, it would adjust the numbers. But it is um, two revolutions for the crankshaft, so to get all four strokes in there. So you can see every every phase of the four-stroke cycle is shown here. So, what do you think this is showing right here? These lines. If this is the I'm not too power, sure. exhaust, intake, compression, what do you think we're seeing right here? Maybe the valve open and closing? Okay, the valve, the exhaust valve right here opened. Right, actually opened right there. See when the pressure went from negative to positive? Yeah. That's when the exhaust valve opened. And then right here is where the exhaust valve closed and the intake valve opened, so I'm seeing intake pressure. Okay. So I can drag my rulers down. I can say this is what exhaust pressure is. Now that, that number said milli PSI, so that says my intake is about negative eight PSI and my exhaust is pretty much zero. It's a um, 60 milli PSI. So if I were to think that there was an exhaust restriction, this probably wouldn't have it or else this exhaust section of this pattern would probably be elevated, right? Because if there was an exhaust, like the valve didn't open or there was a real exhaust, like a cat plug catalytic converter, it wouldn't have anywhere to go and that pressure would stay in the cylinder and I'd measure it by this transducer in there. Okay. So that's kind of cool, huh? I'm gonna switch to our scenes again so we can see this. Uh, so now, so that's exhaust, and then when the intake valve opened, it pulled down into an intake. You can see I got about negative 8 PSI. Here's a quick little conversion that you can do in your head. Whatever the pressure is, if you double it, that's about what the um, uh, vacuum is, at least here for us sea levelers, you know, because mm -hmm. we got about 15 PSI of air pressure, mm -hmm. and that's about 30 inches of barometric pressure, so it's roughly, you know, half, right? Yeah. So if I'm looking at this and it says negative 8 PSI, that's the same thing as 18 inches of vacuum. Now for all you metric users out there, the old kilopascals, you're on your own. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, let's see, so then this is where the, about right here is where the intake valve would have closed and pressure starts building up. Notice how we're in the compression stroke before that pressure starts building? It's because the intake valve doesn't close until that piston's part of the way up on the compression stroke before the intake valve closes. That, 
you know, these valves stay open longer. They don't just, they don't open at top dead center and close at bottom and so forth. They, there's overlap and duration of that valve that makes them kind of hang open for a while. So, so this is pretty cool because think of all the things that we can determine by looking at this pattern. We can look to see, for one, this running compression is about 91 PSI, which is high. And the reason why it's high is because this engine is running so poor, it's got so low vacuum, mm -hmm. we're actually letting a lot of air into the good cylinder. Oh. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because if we, because this cylinder has a misfire on cylinder four, mm -hmm. in order for it to continue to idle like it should, the electronic throttle control is opening the throttle up a little bit, letting mm -hmm. some air in. And now these other cylinders are benefiting from that extra air to keep the engine running at the speed that it thinks it needs to run. So our, you know, it's, it's kind of more of an observation saying, oh yeah, we got 90 PSI of running compression. But then we get to look to see if there's issues with the exhaust by looking at that exhaust portion right here. And then we get to look to see if there's issues with the intake by looking at the intake portion right there. And then this is one of the tricks that people do that if you have a leaking valve or piston rings that are leaking real bad, mm -hmm is that tower, that compression and power tower, right here where it goes up and down, see how symmetrical that is? Like if you were to measure the distance from here to there, you know, let's switch so it's full screen for people looking at a computer screen. If you were to measure the distance from here to here and from there to there, it would pretty much be the same, wouldn't it? Yeah. If you have a leaking cylinder, a cylinder that's leaking like, um, if you have a cylinder that's like got an issue with, uh, come on now. Like there bad are, rings or something? Bad rings or a valve that's not sealed. Maybe got a little bit of a burnt valve seat or a mm -hmm. valve and it's leaking past it. Um, even a, yeah, so anything that can cause leakage in the cylinder that usually causes possibly a tilted tower. Mm. Another thing that it can cause is if this is kind of just a option. And, and these rules aren't always like hard set in stone. There could be exceptions to it. But notice how this bottom, the intake pressure right here, when the piston comes out, because remember there's no combustion in the cylinder. We got the plug out and we got the coil, you know, so it's, it's just an air pump at this point. Mm -hmm. So that compression goes up and then when it comes back down, notice how it gets almost to the exact same spot as the intake vacuum before the exhaust valve opens up. If you had a leak on compression, when the piston comes down on power, mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll get a lower, a dip right in this spot, right here, because some of that pressure that you're squeezing leaked out, and then when the piston comes down, it actually draws into a stronger vacuum mm. than, than the intake vacuum. So that's also an indication of cylinder leakages. So if you look at this pattern here and here, like that, the, this little drop that they've got right here, yeah. if they don't, uh, that, that could be a clue to cylinder leakage if they're not about the same while this thing's running. Okay. So... Um, yeah, good stuff with this pressure transducer, normal cylinder. If I'm going to save this, Alt F A, and you could enter stuff in there, but I'm going to um, just move on to the uh, call it. I'll call it uh, Trailblazer One TB One. And we'll go ahead and move this over to the bad cylinder. I got tools over here. Do you um? Do you have a good singing voice? No. No. <laughs> I thought maybe you could sing for whoever's watching while we're doing this <laughs> stuff. Yeah, fortunately not. No. Yeah. Can you try? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to embarrass myself. So where are you from? That's I'm, the... I'm from Ohio. Ohio. Oh, cool. Isn't that where uh? No, it's Ohio. That's uh, Callahan Auto Parts, Sandusky, Ohio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ever watch Tommy Boy, the movie? No. Okay, that should be required. Um, <laughs> to enter the automotive program, you should be required to watch Tommy Boy. <laughs> okay, I watched that. It, you know, I just watched it like twice in the last week because it was on, I don't know what channel, but you ought to consider watching that. It's a good... It's a very good educational show. Okay, I will. Put that on your list. There are other um, must-watches. Um, have you seen the movie Talladega Nights? I knew you were going to say Why? that. <laughs> I don't know, but actually, I don't know. I've only seen the first 10 minutes of it, so. What? Technically, no. Well, gosh. 
I'm not really a movie person. I'm, uh, I'm starting to get a little disappointed. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, there's there's your weekend right there. Get that homework out of the way so that we... Hey, I, yeah, my, I got a quiz to take. Yeah. That's my weekend. Blow it off. <laughs> okay. Whose class is it? Um, nobody important. <laughs> is it my class? Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right, yeah. If you... In place of the quiz, if you write a, a short book report <laughs> oh, on, really? on Tommy Boy and <laughs> Tell Digga Nights, Honestly, I I'm, this credit. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that instead. <laughs> of course you would. Who wouldn't, right? Right. Okay, so I'm just putting the uh, everything switching over to the bad cylinder. And um, the thing, as you, if you remember from last week, this thing had a dead hole, so it does not run very well at all. There's zero, there was zero compression. And for those of you that watched last week's episode, there was also um, very little cylinder leakage. I think we were getting about 30 psi cylinder leakage because a lot of people I mean, it had uh, it had poor compression. We we verified that with a relative compression test, and then instead of doing a pressure compression test, we went to straight to it with the cylinder leakage tester and it showed the good cylinder showed 20 and the bad cylinder showed 30, which isn't enough to cause a completely dead hole like it was. So then I said, think about this. And there, here we are. We we're seeing a good cylinder. I'm going to fire this back up uh, and we'll start it. And we'll see what our new value are. Come on, Bree. You forgot to tell me to plug it in the pressure transducer. Man. <laughs> well, that's my fault. It's all right. That was a test. You see, <laughs> in, you know, in reality, I should have made a lot more noise than that, but this thing doesn't really build any compression, so... By the way, there's the noise on that pattern. If I take this, if I take this alligator clamp and hook it up to that sensor, the noise will go away. I definitely see what you mean by the slope going out like way lower than. Yeah, I left the, all the information from the previous. Um, let me go full screen with that. I left the cursors up there from the previous cylinder, so we can actually use that as kind of a reference to where pressures were. And if you look, we're not building hardly any compression at all. About five or six psi. And we're also pulling a way stronger vacuum. That's vacuum. And it says negative 13, so it's pulling 26 inches of vacuum. Hmm. And that is a huge clue to what this problem is. Oops, I did something to my up deck here. Um, yeah, there we go. So this is a that's so that's a huge clue. We are seeing still normal exhaust pressure. It's uh you know not really that didn't change at all, and we're seeing a um, a really strong intake vacuum. And if I put my cursors up there, peak to peak, uh, the valve time events still seem to be where they're at. And actually, the strong vacuum that it pulls and a little bit of the cylinders going up and then it's coming back down. The the little pocket that it creates, expansion pocket they call it afterward, it, it pretty much returns to the same spot. So um, anyway, this is a this is showing the problem. I don't want to give it away because this is a bug for this class. So I don't necessarily want to just say what it is. Because then I, 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 I just watch this thing. <laughs> I mean, 
give them again to this point and then they figure it out and uh, or have to think about what could cause no cylinder leakage to speak of or, or minimal cylinder leakage no compression really strong vacuum um, and obviously a misfire and one other thing I'm going to mention and I'll let you if you guys think you know what it is you could post it in the comments and I will private message you if you're right or wrong I'll try to do it that way no Bree you can't message me <laughs> and I won't Oh, yeah. I probably you, will. You're going to create a fake <laughs> yeah, I was gonna Facebook say that. or something account, right? Yeah, that's funny. And then you get in. Oh, by the way, I noticed these other cars in the lab. I was wondering, wait a minute. So if yeah. you happen to have a, a Sentra that had an engine noise. Right. <laughs> no. Anyway, those are other problems we got in this class. I want to mention one other thing that I didn't mention with that previous, that good waveform. And I'm going to pull it up real quick. One other thing that I forgot to show you guys is that a lot of people want to try to figure out how to measure cam timing. Um, sometimes cam timing is a pain in the butt to do in the vehicle because of, of uh, the location of the marks and um, taking covers off and all that kind of stuff can sometimes be difficult. You can check cam timing on most vehicles just by using this pressure transducer. You can see I put those four cursors up there the rulers and Altel does this really well too. And even if you didn't have Altel, you could still do this, uh, you know, using PowerPoint or Microsoft Word just by copying and pasting the image. But this line right here, the 180 degree mark line and the 360 degree mark line, you should see that exhaust transition from like a vacuum to exhaust pressure just before the 180 mark. And it should go from exhaust pressure to intake pressure just after the 360. If my cam timing's off, those events shift. So you're gonna have a greater space here and then it's gonna drop down, or you're gonna have this thing cutting across it, you know, like that 180 mark. Mm -hmm. now obviously with VVT, that does make a difference if you got variable valve timing, but when you're checking a vehicle at idle and it's basically at its nominal um, idle state, if you will, that's usually the case that you'll see. You really can't do that with it cranking without starting because because the VVT is going to go into a phase where it'll make for easier starting. So you would expect the actual cam position to be off a little bit. But with the engine running at idle, on just every vehicle I've checked here, um, the transition from power to exhaust happens just before the 180 mark, and the transition from exhaust to intake happens right after the 360 mark, as you can see in these uh, pat that pattern right there. So. So it's kind of a cool tool, isn't it? Yeah. Now I have heard of people making homemade versions of these because you can buy off eBay these little pressure transducers. They only cost like fifteen dollars, and I've tried making them before. But the problem is, is that they uh, they're, they're, they produce like a they only produce a voltage at a timed interval, and then when you look at this, it looks like stair steps. Oh yeah. And they also don't measure the vacuum as well. So I don't know if that's the same type of a sensor and the circuitry inside these little uh, boxes kind of smooth that pattern out. Um, my guess is somebody out there, they've made a box that controls these cheap transducers and they seem to work. I'd be interested in seeing how they did it. But um, otherwise, an older fl Fluke PV350, Ditex, D-I-T-E-X, I think it's a European company, they make them. They're a lot cheaper than some of the others, I have not, I don't have any experience with it. ATS makes some, they make the transducers and then a box to power it. And by the time you get to both of them, they're maybe $600 or something. But then of course the gold standard is the Pico WPS 500. It does not have to be, uh, you don't have to use it only on a Pico, you could use it on anything, not any kind of scope, but it's made by Pico, it's made for automotive, and they have the sensor, and then you can get the kits with the, all the different adapters and things get expensive. If you're interested in any of that stuff, I suggest you go to aeswave.com or autonerds, and that's nerds with a z.com, and they are pretty good uh, representative salespeople of Pico equipment. So what do you think? Do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, after we get off the live. And we have live. I don't want to sound stupid on live. Oh, come on. <laughs> There's a, to check the battery on these things, you actually turn it off 
and then you measure the voltage because when you turn it off, these will have about 100 millivolts or more if the battery's still good. If the battery's bad, you need to kind of, uh, obviously it will give you bad readings. So, no questions, huh? After. <laughs> After. She will to put herself on the spot. Thank you for the content. Can you please post the replay? Yeah, it'll be up there. The replay will be, sometimes it takes a, a little bit, they process it, but it'll always be on our page. And then under the content, there's a section that says live, and then that's where it'll be. Um, this person's from Veracruz, Mexico. I love that. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Are you using the typical rubber pressure adapter in the spark plug hole? Ever use a solid well adapter with a fluke? I do use the, um, just the compression test hoses off of just a normal compression test kit. That makes it easy. Now I have built, I've taken spark plugs. That's a good question because you gotta be aware with that rubber hose, if you, uh, if you let it run for a while, it gets hot and the, it, the hose can fall apart. I've had that happen in class before where the students have run these things and then when they go to take the hose out, it comes off and it leaves the end in the head, which can be a real bear because you can't get a socket on it. You know, there's no, no socket in. So I did make a bunch of these uh, little pipes. Maybe I'll switch this, oh, it's too light. Well, maybe not. I did make a bunch of these little pipes that allow me to um, uh, go into center. Now these pipes get hot too, so that's something you gotta be aware of when you go grab it. You don't wanna burn your fingers off. But, um, and the way I, I build these is that I just take a spark plug and I break out the ceramic on the inside. So it's a, basically just a hole. If I can zoom in on that, let's maybe put something there. Um, and then I weld a fitting on the end. So now my compression gauge will just plug into it. I've got a few different ones that have angles on them in the 90s because sometimes where you're trying to get like if it's a v engine you can't always get that in there so you have to just it seems like every time I, I did a newer engine or a different engine i had to make a new one but i get lazy and then i just use the rubber hose so a long answer but for a good question and yes yeah, so i have not used that other you said a uh oops um Ever use the solid well adapter with the fluke? I don't know what a solid well adapter is. But, um, so, I guess I haven't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess um, I'll just answer. Anybody that's questioned anything on Facebook, I'll, I'll answer that later because I don't uh, see how I can get into it on my phone. Probably because I'm logged in as um, me. Uh, because I don't see, I'm just looking to see if, uh, I should have figured this out ahead of time, but feel free to ask questions and I'll answer them whenever, um, you know, I get a chance online. And that was it, pressure transducer diagnostics. Think about what this vehicle has for a problem. It's got very strong vacuum, building no pressure, uh, has low or no, no compression on that cylinder, dead hole. So cylinder number four, is horrible. Cylinder number uh, three or two it was was great. So I had something to compare it to. The clue is is negative 13 psi intake stroke, 26 inches of vacuum, and no compression. And that that should be enough for you to figure out what it is. So that is about all we had for you. Thanks for watching, and uh, catch you on the next one.